Hello, my fine students of American history, and welcome back to the video lecture series focusing on the Gilded Age. In the last video lecture, we discussed the benefits and drawbacks of the Industrial Age, and the dismal working conditions of many industrial laborers was one of the major issues that opponents of the Industrial Age brought attention to. Life for workers in industrial America was difficult. Many workers had to perform dull, repetitive tasks in work environments that were often unhealthy and dangerous. Workers inhaled dust and toxic fumes, heavy machines lacking safety devices caused many injuries and death. In 1900, the average industrial worker made 22 cents an hour and worked 59 hours a week. At that time, there were very few regulations dictating workers' safety, hours, or wages. Throughout the late 1800s, in an effort to improve wages, hours, and working conditions, workers began organizing large nationwide labor unions. There was a lot of opposition to labor unions by the government and industry leaders. Factory owners often took steps to discourage union membership. Some required workers to sign contracts promising not to join a union. Workers who tried to organize a union were fired and placed on a blacklist, which would ensure that no company would hire them. When workers did form unions, companies used lockouts to keep the workers out and hired strike breakers and replacement workers. Unions also suffered from the perception that they were un-American and many associated union activity with the ideas of communist philosopher Karl Marx. Many of the large strikes that occurred in that era ended when the government intervened, usually against the strikers. In response to wage cuts, in 1873, railroad workers went on strike in the Great Railway Strike. The strike, which began in West Virginia, soon spread across the country and involved up to 80,000 railroad employees. In response, President Hayes declared a state of insurrection and sent federal troops to West Virginia, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh to restore order. By the time it was over, more than 100 people had died. During the Homestead Steel Strike in 1892, workers at the Carnegie Steel Company went on strike after rejecting a 20% wage cut. Violence broke out when the company locked out employees and hired detectives from the Pinkerton Detective Agency to break up the picket lines. In response, state militia were sent in and ended the strike. In 1895, the federal courts brought an end to the Pullman Railroad strike. Again, federal troops intervened to break it up. One reason that the government offered for intervening to end strikes was that strikes did impact the rest of the country. If railroad workers went on strike, for instance, shipping across the country could come to a standstill and other industries could be negatively impacted. One of the early big unions that formed was the Knights of Labor, which was founded in 1869. The Knights of Labor, under the leadership of a man named Terence Powderly, advocated for broad political reforms, such as a federally mandated eight-hour workday, an end to child labor, the creation of worker-owned factories, and equal pay for women. By 1885, membership in the Knights of Labor grew close to 700,000. However, in 1886, an event known as the Haymarket Affair severely diminished the union's reputation and the view of labor unions in general. On May 1, 1886, the Knights of Labor led a march of 80,000 people in Chicago calling for an eight-hour workday. Over the next few days, nearly 70,000 workers went on strike throughout the city. On May 4, 3,000 people gathered in Chicago's Haymarket Square in support of the strikers. And at one point, someone threw a bomb into the crowd, and a riot erupted between police and workers. After this incident, many people came to view labor unions and their leaders as dangerous, violent anarchists. Despite the violence at Haymarket, union activism continued. Other unions were formed, including the American Federation of Labor, which was created in 1886. Their first president, Samuel Gompers, led the union until 1924. Rather than seeking broader political goals, the AFL focused mainly on what Gompers called bread and butter unionism, meaning issues that directly impacted workers, such as better wages and hours and safety. The Industrial Workers of the World was organized in 1905. 
The IWW was viewed as a more radical and socialist organization than other unions. Although the IWW never gained a large membership, its radical and Marxist philosophy led many to condemn unions in general as subversive and dangerous. Depending on who one was and how one was impacted, some viewed labor unions as the champion of the rights of the working man and woman, while others viewed them as dangerous, radical organizations bent on overthrowing the government and establishing a communist state. Again, like many of the issues of this era, this is something that we continue to discuss as a nation.